Hello students, today we are discussing another important developmental disorder called as Tick's disorder. We will be focusing especially on Tourette's syndrome, one of the significant tick disorders. So, before we discuss what is Tourette's syndrome or Tourette's disorder, let us try to understand what is a tick disorder. A tick is a repetitive, uncontrollable, purposeless contraction of an individual muscle or group of muscles usually in the face, arms or shoulders. Ticks are sudden twitches, movements or sounds that people do repeatedly. People who have ticks cannot stop their body from doing these things. For example, you might have seen a person with a motor tick might keep blinking over and over again or a person with a ocal tick might make a grunting sound unwillingly. These tick movements may be sometimes signs of a minor psychological disturbance. Such ticks often occur in childhood and will generally be outgrown as they develop, that is as their age increases. There are also ticks that are caused by neurological disorders that could have resulted from brain damage at birth, head trauma or use of some specific medication. Suppose if we have to see what generally the ticks involve, ticks may involve movements that occur again and again and do not have a rhythm, an overwhelming urge to make the movement. Ticks can be motor ticks or we can say phonic ticks. When I say motor ticks, that is related to the bodily movements. For example, blinking, clenching of the fist, curling the toes, kicking, raising the eyebrows, shrugging the shoulders, sticking out the tongue. Similarly, ticks may also involve phonic or vocal ticks. That means, these ticks are related to sounds. For example, clicking, grunting, moaning, snorting and squealing. Once we have understood what is a tick disorder, what it involves, whether it is related to the motor movements or the phonic movements, there are also like variety of tick disorders and how we classify these tick disorders based upon what? So, the classification of tick disorders is generally based on diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders that is DSM-4 TR. According to this DSM-4 TR, there are four tick disorders. The first one is chronic motor or ocal tick disorder. If we have to know what is this particular classification or what is this particular type of disorder, it is either single or multiple motor or phonic ticks, but not both, which are present for more than a year. The second type according to this classification is transient tick disorder. It consists of multiple motor and phonic ticks with a duration of at least 4 weeks, but less than 12 months. The third type of disorder is Tourette's disorder. It is also called as Tourette's syndrome and it is written as TS. It is diagnosed when both motor and phonic ticks are present for more than a year. The last type of disorder according to this classification is tick disorder not otherwise specified. This disorder is diagnosed when ticks are present but do not meet the criteria for any specific tick disorder. Now, once we have seen the classification, let us try to understand the diagnosis of tick disorders. How do we diagnose? For a person to be diagnosed with a chronic tick disorder, he or she must meet the following criteria. The first criteria is, the person must have one or more motor ticks, for example, blinking or shrugging the shoulders or ocal tics like humming, clearing the throat, 
or yelling out a word or phrase, but not both. That is, it is not necessary that motor tics and vocal tics have to be present. The second criteria is the person must have tics that occur many times a day, nearly every day, or on and off throughout a period of more than a year. During this period, there must not be any single tick free period of more than 3 months. The third criteria is the person's ticks must start before he or she is 18 years of age. Fourth criteria is the person's symptoms must not be due to taking medicine or other drugs or to having another medical condition like seizures, Huntington disease or post viral encephalitis. The last criteria is the person must not have been diagnosed with TS that is Tourette syndrome. So, these are the general criteria that are taken into consideration when we classify the tick disorders or when we are diagnosing the tick disorders. We can say in general four characteristics are used to identify and diagnose tick disorders. The first characteristic is the age when ticks began. The second characteristic is duration of the ticks. The third is severity of the ticks. The fourth is whether ticks are motor or vocal or both. So, these characteristics will help us to identify whether the, there is a presence of tick disorder and if so, what is which type of tick disorder is present in a particular individual. Let us see now what are the characteristics of Tourette syndrome. Just now we have tried to understand what is tick disorder, what are the criteria that are used in the classification and how we diagnose. So, now try to understand especially one significant tick disorder called Tourette syndrome. So, what are the characteristics of the Tourette syndrome? In the Tourette syndrome, both multiple motor and one or more vocal tics are present at some time during the illness, although not necessarily simultaneously. Another characteristic is in Tourette syndrome, tics are recurrent, non-rhythmic, stereotyped actions or vocalizations that can usually be suppressed for a period when a person focuses on stopping them. Another important characteristic of TS that is Tourette syndrome is less than 40 percent of people with TS have coprolalia that means swearing or yelling out foul language. Another characteristic of Tourette syndrome is most people experience a discomforting sensation prior to their tics which disappears after they carry out the tic. Tics occur many times a day, nearly every day or intermittently throughout a span of more than one year. Significant impairment or marked distress in social, occupational or other important areas of functioning. So, sometimes we also see the distress in these important areas of functioning. Generally, this TS onset occurs before the age of 21. Sometimes symptoms can disappear for weeks or months at a time and severity wakes and wanes. Most people experience less ticks as they get older. Nearly 50 percent of people have significantly less ticks as they reach adulthood. Once we have understood the characteristics of Tourette's disorder, now how to diagnose the presence of Tourette's disorder in an individual. It is found that no blood analysis, x-ray or other medical test exists to identify Tourette's syndrome. However, the first step in diagnosis 
occurs when a young person is brought to their doctor for evaluation. Sometimes this happens when a parent is concerned about tics or another symptom of Tourette syndrome. Some other times it occurs at a regularly scheduled checkup when a person's doctor notices these symptoms during a routine physical examination. Many people with tics do not actually have Tourette syndrome. For example, transient tics of childhood is a benign condition which can be present in a quarter of young children. Therefore, upon seeing the signs of Tourette syndrome, many primary care doctors that means family physicians, family doctors and pediatricians may refer their patient to a specialist. This reference to the specialist is not only because Tourette syndrome is most frequently managed by neurologists and psychiatrists, but also because it is important that any person with newly diagnosed tics have a thorough medical and neurological examination. In some people, this examination may include radiological tests that is using CT scans, MRIs and EEGs and blood test. So, there is need for the specialist thorough evaluation to diagnose Tourette syndrome as opposed to an infection, a medication side effect or another neurological illness as the source of the tics. Pathophysiology. Once the analysis has been taken in order to find out the diagnosis, let, let us understand what is pathophysiology. That is, the pathophysiology of the disorder indicates any biological relation to the onset of this disorder. The research indicates that the exact mechanism affecting the inherited vulnerability to Tourette's has not been established and the precise etiology is unknown. Ticks are believed to result from dysfunction in cortical and subcortical regions, the thalamus basal ganglia and frontal cortex. Neuroanatomic models implicate failures in circuits connecting the brain's cortex and subcortex and imaging techniques implicate the basal ganglia and frontal cortex. Once we have understood the nature, the characteristics, the diagnosis, now, let us see what is the treatment involved in treating this particular disorder. Like any other behavioral disorders or developmental disorders, even the tic disorders frequently do not require pharmacological treatment for the suppression of tics as long as they do not cause the impairment. However, in certain conditions, if required, first line treatment options include dopamine modulators and behavioral therapy. There is no one medication that is helpful to all people with Tourette syndrome nor does any medication completely eliminate symptoms. However, effective medications are available for those whose symptoms interfere with functioning. Medication treatment of Tourette syndrome usually focuses on decreasing the severity, frequency and discomfort of tics for people with significant social and occupational difficulties due to their symptoms. Treatment of tics often includes medications from the antipsychotic class of drugs which are referred to as dopamine blockers or neuroleptics. These medications carry the risk of substantial side effects namely movement disorders like tardive dyskinesia, weight gain and metabolic syndrome. Sometimes in certain cases surgeries and other procedural treatments like botulinum toxin injection, deep brain stimulation and transcranial magnetic stimulation are also included. However, generally they are not recommended and only in rare cases 
they suggest for the use of these surgeries and other procedural treatments. Another important aspect in the treatment of this Tourette syndrome is there is need to treat the coexisting symptoms because any particular disorder especially the behavioral disorder or any other psychological disorder if the related coexisting symptoms are not focused upon or not treated that may hamper the self esteem and the overall functioning of an individual. For example, in Tourette's syndrome a person may have OCD and in those cases we have to focus upon the treatment of OCD by using any cognitive behavioral therapy. Suppose if there is a severity of OCD in such cases we need to treat with a medication from the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor class of medications to control their obsessions and compulsions. Similarly, sometimes a person affected with Tourette syndrome may also have ADHD. Naturally, we need to focus upon the treatment of ADHD too and this may require treatment with stimulant medications or other medications to improve their concentration and also to control impulsive behaviors. However, we should note that stimulant medications carry the risk of increasing tick severity and therefore, as with any other medications, the pros and cons should be discussed with the patient's physicians. You cannot have a simple treatment, a similar treatment to all the individuals affected with Tourette syndrome. Once the coexisting symptoms differ, naturally the treatment process also take a different shape for every individual. Apart from this, behavioral therapies are also recommended as a first choice treatment for tics. Especially in this case of Tourette syndrome, the behavioral therapies mainly focus on HRT and ERP. What is this HRT? HRT refers to habit reversal therapy. In this therapy, the client is helped or the client is made to learn responses that is other movements which compete with ticks meaning that the tick cannot happen at the same time. That is when an individual is about to show the tick he has to replace that with the newly learnt movements so that the tick will not occur at that moment. This habit reversal therapy teaches client to use these competing responses when he gets the feeling that he need to tick until the feeling goes away. Naturally, when you inculcate a new habit in the presence of the old habit, once it becomes, once the new habit becomes a part of the personality, naturally the old behaviors can be reduced. Based upon this principle, this habit reversal therapy focuses upon the treatment of the client's ticks. The other particular technique which we use especially in dealing with Tourette syndrome is exposure with response prevention. This is something like helping the client get used to the overwhelming unpleasant feelings that are often experienced just before a tick. Naturally, it is something like when a person is having an exaggerated fear of a particular situation repeatedly asking him to imagine the situation or repeatedly exposing the individual to the similar situation that may lead to the lessening of the feelings towards that particular situation. The same principle is followed in this particular ERP. There are also number of medications that can improve ticks in some people. But only thing is in all cases medication is not necessary, we have to see in which case they also require the medication. For example, in severe adult cases, a new surgical treatment for ticks called deep brain stimulation may be used. Apart from this new surgical treatment, other treatments which include are psychological counseling, support groups and biofeedback with limited results. 
The natural course and outcome of this disorder is variable and in many situations as the individual matures in the age, the degree of the tics and the disorder tunes down gradually regardless of the medication effects. Tic disorders and Tourette syndrome are frequently associated with comorbid conditions such as obsessive compulsive symptoms, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, anxiety and depression, behavioral disorders and sleep difficulties. So, it is essential to identify and address these comorbid conditions as they often cause more distress and disability than the ticks themselves. Sometimes when we focus on these comorbid conditions that may lead to the enhancement of the treatment for the Tourette's disorder or the tics disorder too. Tourette's syndrome is a spectrum disorder. Its severity ranges over a spectrum from mild to severe. The majority of cases are mild and require no treatment. In these cases, the impact of symptoms on the individual may be mild to the extent that casual observers might not know of their condition. The overall prognosis is positive, but a minority of children with Tourette syndrome have severe symptoms that persist into adulthood. These rare minority of severe cases can exhibit or prevent individuals from holding a job or having a fulfilling social life. Regardless of symptom severity, individuals with Tourette's have a normal lifespan. Sometimes the symptoms may be lifelong and chronic for certain individuals, but the condition is not degenerative or life threatening. If we consider the factor of intelligence, this is very normal in those with Tourette's disorder, although there may be some learning disabilities in these individuals. However, Severity of tics early in life does not predict tic severity in later life and prognosis is generally favorable although there is no reliable means of predicting the outcome for a particular individual. The gene or genes associated with Tourette's have not been identified so far and so there is no potential cure. However, we can say apart from the medication and the behavioral therapies like in any other case where the individual is suffering with the behavioral disorders or developmental disorders or personality disorders, the family environment plays an important role. A supportive environment and family generally gives the children or the adults with the Tourette's disorder the skills to manage the disorder. People with Tourette's may learn to camouflage socially inappropriate tics or to channel the energy of their tics into a functional endeavor. It is quite interesting to know that many accomplished musicians, athletes, public speakers and professionals from all walks of life are found among people with Tourette's. Outcomes in adulthood are associated more with the perceived significance of having severe tics as a child than with the actual severity of the tics. So, we can conclude the today's session that tic is one of the significant behavioral disorders generally found among the children and as the age increases the tics are also lessened or completely they might be eliminated in certain cases. So, we can say Tick is a repetitive, uncontrollable, purposeless contraction of an individual muscle or group of muscles which usually occur in the face, arms or shoulders. Depending upon the DSM-4 classification that is DSM-4 TR classification, we can say like there are four important categories like chronic motor or occult tick disorder, transient tick disorder, Tourette's disorder disorder not otherwise specified. Generally, 
the tic disorders involve either motor tics that is motor movements or it could be the phonic tics and in some cases it could be both. Generally we try to diagnose the presence of the tic disorders based upon the age when tics began, the duration, severity and the presence of both motor or ocal tics or single that is only motor or only ocal. Coming to the treatment, generally there is no single medication as such or we cannot say that is we cannot ascertain that medication will eliminate completely all the symptoms of tic disorders. However, if necessary in certain cases we go for the medication where we use either the dopamine blockers or serotonin reuptakes, but however only medication will not reduce the presence of the symptoms of the tic disorders. In rare cases they also suggest the surgeries and other procedural treatments. Apart from all this we cannot ignore the importance of behavioral therapies. Especially in the behavioral therapy the importance is given to the habit reversal therapy and exposure therapy. Along with this the family environment, awareness of the parents with regard to the tic disorder that is a re-education program all these contribute for the better enhancement of the self-esteem of the individual who is affected with the Tourette's disorder or the tics disorder. Even if a person is affected with the presence of the Tourette's disorder or a tic disorder, we need not worry about the prognosis of the disorder because generally the prognosis is very favorable, it is very positive. They say even in certain cases without much intervention of the medication as the age increases the symptoms will also decrease. In spite of the presence of the symptoms of tic disorders, there are many people who accomplished in their selected fields like music or sports or in the public as or as public speakers.